ready for chapter eight? <clears throat> An awkward moment. Church on Sunday mornings was often a pleasant diversion, but on this day, Mr. Teasdale did not deliver one of his better sermons. He usually thumped and rumbled, which was much more elevating. He'd had to write this one quickly, I realized. If a person were murdered on a Saturday, the vicar was obligated to soothe his flock the very next morning, which must put dreadful pressure on his pious creativity. Some poor soul had taken a wrong turn, he said, veered off the road to heaven and tumbled into a pit of vipers. It fell upon the rest of us to show compassion to the lost, to those in darkness, to our brethren in need. The notion of our brethren in need allowed the vicar to move smoothly to his urgent invitation. Would we please adjourn to the church basement after the service to aid his effort for indigent strangers from foreign parts? He skipped right over the likelihood that the murderous lost soul in question was very possibly among these very parishioners. I cast an eye along the pew, staring at each upturned face. Which of them might have wished Miss Marianne dead? Many in town thought she was a bit of a nut. She wanted corsets banned. She thought women ought to be allowed to vote. <gasps> she thought all adults, whether they owned property or not, ought to be allowed to vote. She had never been married, which caused great suspicion among the other ladies, I'd noticed. Suspicion or pity, but how might any of that be reason to kill? Which members of our parish could be so disturbed by a spinster's oddities? Everyone stood for a final hymn. Behold the strangers at the door. My question had borne only further questions. Who? Why? How? The basement of All Saints Church had been transformed into a street market. Tables dragged into long rows. Ever-growing piles of useful offerings came not only from the Mermaid Room concert, but from all over the parish, carried to All Saints in crates and baskets, boxes and bags, which now covered the floor. Women sorted and folded and stacked. Children scurried back and forth, carrying books or trinkets or teapots from one spot to another, helping to organize the offerings. Thank you, Mr. Teasdale, for a heartening sermon, said Charlotte and how gratifying to have received so many donations. You must be proud. Not proud, my dear, but humble in the face of such generosity. Mr. Teasdale beamed and then remembered, looking grim instead, and sorely tested by the evil we have so recently met, he said. I pray that no unknown foreigner has performed this despicable act. Charlotte dodged that idea by pro-offering her services. Let us help as many as we may today, she said. So he's wanting to blame it on the immigrants from the other countries, these people that they don't even know um, that are in their town. Remember, they were fleeing for all different kinds of reasons, and that's why they were gathering all these uh, coats and things to begin with. And that's who he has now said twice that he is suspicious of. And, of course, we know that Agatha, Aggie, is really kind of more suspicious of the people right there in the town that knew Miss Eversham, right? I had already found a task, unpacking books and setting them up in rows. Mr. Teasdale Prayer felt like a wasted one, in my opinion. How and why would an unknown foreigner sneak into the mermaid room carrying poison? I whispered to Charlotte once the vicar had moved on. Shh, said Charlotte. Do you think upon, the, do you, oh, sorry, let me try. Do not think upon such things. All these boring books, I said a moment later. Why would a foreigner want to read one? to learn the English language, naturally, said Charlotte. But I held up a book to show gold lettering on the cover. The World as Will and Idea by Arthur Schnappenhauer. Surely a child's primer would be more useful than this. Something with pictures, perhaps? They called primers, that's what they called like t uh, children's textbooks, children's uh, reading books like you would read when you were in pre-K in kindergarten. Those are called primers. Just dust them, said Charlotte. We are not here to question. But, oh, good morning, Mrs. Teasdale, said Charlotte. The biker's wife hovered like a seagull, waiting to pounce on any scrap she might spe spear with her beak. Good morning, Miss Graves. Her smile was always hard to discern because her lips were so thin. Good morning, Agatha. Mrs. Teasdale, I bobbed my head. 
You've had a shocking time, she said to me. I bobbed my head again, it being easier to agree than to explain that finding a corpse was a stimulating sort of shock rather than one of the unpleasant variety. I was with Rose Eversham, you know, said Mrs. Teasdale, when she got word of her mother's death. She was here helping to set up the tables and such. Rose Eversham was in the church basement while her mother was being murdered. Oh, that was good of her, said Charlotte. That was lucky, I thought. She could not have done that dreadful deed, not alone anyway. She did not help us with with goodness and oh she did not help us with goodness in her heart. What does that mean? Sounds like she's saying that she didn't do it nicely. She did not help us with goodness in her heart, said Mrs. Teasdale, but as penance for using the Lord's name in vain during choir practice. Oh, it was a consequence for her being there. She wasn't there because she wanted to. My husband is cunning when it comes to gathering volunteers for church functions. I noticed then that the biker's wife seemed to be holding someone's arm, a smallish someone out of sight behind her. I'm sure Rose Eversham was most grateful to be in a place of refuge when the news came, said Charlotte. I had my smelling salts ready, said Mrs. Teasdale, but they were not needed. The girl barely flinched. Her spirit is a briar patch, that one. If I were not a Christian, I'd say she'd smiled when my husband spoke with her. A man of great insight, said Charlotte. No doubt he coaxed a smile of bravery with words of comfort. She's trying to be nice and the biker's wife is not being nice, right? Have you met our visitor? Mrs. Teasdale pulled on the arm, trying to bring its owner into view. He has come to stay with us at the vicarage for a month, for a few months, so that we may set an example of charity to our parishioners, our own little immigrant. Hector! Aren't you, dear? Her voice got louder when she spoke to him. I saw that Hector wished the stones of the floor would split open and swallow him into the earth below. We're waiting to hear whether the rest of his family will be joining him. Mrs. Teasdale spoke extra slowly. Belchum is quite civilized on the surface of things, but their wretched king has behaved so badly. I'm not surprised that Hector's father has sent his son away for a time. She was like talking like he's stupid instead of just that he is from a different country, right? So she's trying to talk all slow like he's dumb. He's not dumb. Mrs. Teasdale, I began. I know Hector, Madame said Hector. I have already the pleasure of... The schools in England are better, of course, said Mrs. Teasdale. Think what they might be teaching in a country where everyone speaks French. (gasps) French or Flemish, madame, said Hector. Goodness, what have you got there? She poked at the collection of things that Hector, Hector held in his arms. Are those for your father, dear? Her voice was loud to the point of being shrill. She tried to tug free a shiny black shoe from Hector's collection. These are quite impractical, she said. Shall I help you find something else? Non, madame. These are for me. I'd seen those shoes dropped into one of the bins at the mermaid dance room the night before the murder. Hector might be the only person in Torquay who would consider them a treasure worth fighting for. They had found a good home. He also had a woolly green hat and a book. A study in scarlet. I said, Sherlock Holmes is my favorite. Hector smiled. I am now to read in English, he said. Mrs. Teasdale sighed and relinquished her grip on the patent leather shoe. She asked Charlotte to assist in moving a stack of table linens. I stayed by the books, immobilized by revelation. Hector's jacket was neat and fit him well with no visible patches. An English boy might be seen wearing the very same item. His hair was clean, his teeth bright, and his manners good enough to have impressed Granny Jane. His accent was odd, but he did not smell of any exotic spice. Admittedly, my experience of boys was limited to those I saw on the street or roller skating on the Prince's Pier. Hector was not especially different from any of those, aside from being clever and unusually polite. He liked sweets. He liked mysteries. And to read Sherlock Holmes. And yet he was also a charity boy. His eyes held an urgent question. I guessed that he was wondering what I would wonder if we were to change places. Will you still be my friend? I nodded yes, yes, yes.
He didn't actually say it. She just could tell that that's what he was asking. Because now she's found out he's one of these immigrant kids that they were collecting all of these goods for, right? One of the immigrant families. And she had just, when she met him, she just thought he was another boy, a French boy with a, you know, who spoke French with a French accent. She didn't think anything of it. But now all of a sudden that he's an immigrant charity boy, it kind of gave her a, like she had to think twice about it, right? But then of course, she's still going to be his friend. She doesn't care. His smile was wide, but lasted only a moment. He held up a folded piece of paper, pale blue and wrinkled. He beckoned me to watch closely as he carefully revealed its inner folds. It was dusted with white powder like a fine fruit sugar gathered more heavily in the creases. Hector displayed it open on his palm like a jewel of great value. I find this inside my new left shoe, he whispered. What is it? I licked my finger to dab a sample. Do not taste it. My finger froze. It is possible that I am mistaken, said Hector. But to me, it looks very much like poison. <gasps> Charlotte, so good at appearing, where unwanted, snorted out a small laugh. She plucked the paper from Hector's hand. You children are getting entirely too fanciful. Poison indeed. Your mother is already concerned about your morbid preoccupation, Miss Aggie. Without a new chum to encourage it further, this will be the end of it. Well, that wasn't very nice, was it? She crumpled Hector's discovery and dropped it into a box of rubbish under a nearby table. No more foolish chatter about murder. Do you hear me? I believe your friendship will benefit from a hiatus. Master Perot, we shall now take our leave. Good afternoon. <gasps> oh, no, Charlotte. That's her first. That's a good friend. I don't think she has many friends, remember? Hector had listened with his eyes cast down, his pallor a shade wider. I yearned to exchange a grimace, but alas, Charlotte's hand on my elbow led me firmly away. I looked back once to see Hector swiftly extracting his precious clue from where I had been tossed and flashing me a grin of fervent conspiracy. So he, he fished it out of the trash pile, right? So he could still keep the powder. And that is the end of chapter eight. But I told everyone I would read chapter nine because I am so late in getting chapter eight up. So chapter nine. A brief instruction. Home from church and following a lunch of turbo and cream sauce. Turbo, T-U-R-B-O-T. -T. You guys are really good at looking up things. Can you guys look that up? T-U-R-B-O-T. -T. I'm going to guess some type of, of a fish, but I don't know. A lunch of turbo and cream sauce. I now prepared for the afternoon's excursion, admiring my reflection in the hallway mirror. The black felt morning hat was quite becoming atop my ringlets. One of the small consolations when Papa died last year had been a new wardrobe of vividly doleful clothes. This adorable little hat was one of my favorites. I would not say that I was happy for an excuse to wear it again, but I was not precisely unhappy either. Bereavement, said Granny Jane. As you well know, to have lost a close relation or friend because of death. She tugged on her second purple glove, finger by finger. Only the color purple with blay or black or gray was considered acceptable when visiting the bereaved. That means the people that are grieving from a lost person, a, a person that had died. I suspected that Granny was as attached to her purple gloves as I was to my hat. My pleasure was diminished at having to wear a dove gray Sunday coat handed down for my sister despite its wide shoulders. I suppose, I suppose it is good fortune that our own loss allows us to be correctly costumed to express bereavement. My grandmother paused in the glove-tugging battle. Thanks to your own dear papa. Granny Jane's own dear son, I thought. Naturally, a year ago, you were in no state of mind to consider the etiquette that surrounds the departure of every soul to heaven. The funeral for Irma Eversham had not yet occurred and would wait until the police permitted. The family, however, Miss Rose and her aunt, Miss Mary Ann, would be at home this afternoon to receive condolences. Where do you suppose her soul might be? I wondered, since her body is detained at the Torquay Hospital Morgue. Oh, most distressing, said Granny Jane, to have one's earthly remains loitering about. The soul, no doubt, must linger with it. All the more important that we appear for the visitation today. But how exactly did one express polite sorrow when a person had been murdered? A person for whom there was no great affection. Especially when one had so many questions. For instance, 
Had the large and unwieldy corpse been moved down that steep and narrow stairway into the bustle of Union Street before riding to the morgue? She looked heavy and awkward. Did they carry her at a vertical angle with that oddly arched spine and those crookedly flung limbs? I shook my head vigorously, banishing the vision. Did Granny and Mummy ever have these dreadful sorts of thoughts about Papa? Mummy would not be joining this afternoon's excursion because her own bereavement for Papa had been refreshed by Irma Eversham's demise. She had not risen from her bed since the inspector's visit yesterday. I forced my thoughts along a more poetic path. Bereavement made me feel like a jar full of freshly collected garden worms. My innards were wiggling in the most unsettled way, but I had no interest in lying about beneath the bed covers in a darkened room. I was, I was ferociously curious to know who in Torquay was a wicked assassin. Granny Jane, just to be clear, is bereavement necessary only for a loved one? The whole town knows that Rose's mother was a cross patch. She and Miss Marianne fought like cats over a dead over a fish's head. Squabbled like seagulls over a sandwich crust, this is in her brain. Battled like God and the devil over a dying soul. Granny Jane made a harumping noise. You've been listening to gossip, haven't you? No, Granny, I've been gathering evidence. She was taking a turn in front of the mirror to adjust her hat. She laughed her rare, dear, horsey laugh. One of my greatest pleasures was to inspire that laugh. So her grandmother was laughing and she didn't usually laugh and it made Aggie happy that she had been the one that made her laugh. I am gratified that you understand the tremendous value of listening to the conversation of your elders, said Granny Jane. Please remember, however, that gossip is like river silt. One must sift it carefully to discover gold amongst the pebbles. Do you understand? Um, I said, not really. She didn't say that out loud. That's just what she was thinking. Only what you see with your own eyes can truly be trusted, she said, or that which you hear with your own ears. No one can see, no one can see God, I said. Are we not meant to trust him? <sighs> Granny Jane sighed. We shall address the matter of God on another day. Young Leonard is waiting to drive us to Evermore. Eversham Villa was mostly hidden by trees. I could have got there in a wink, past the animal c cemetery over the stile with my skirts hiked up and across the creek on stepping stones. But for someone so rickety as Granny Jane... May I never be 66, I frequently prayed. Taking the cart was a necessity. The poor old woman did not like to walk even so far as the end of the drive, let alone out onto Bertram Road and all the way up the winding path to Evermore. Although today's venture must not be called exhilarating, visiting the home of a murdered victim was not a usual outing. I vowed to remain alert to suspicious behavior on the part of our fellow guests. Never shirk your duty, my dear, said Granny, as we joust along. When it comes to visitations and funerals, mourn unto others as you would have them mourn unto you. <clears throat> Where's the mom, I wonder? And Charlotte, are they not going with them? Oh, Granny, please don't speak of dying. I slid my white-gloved hand into her purple one. You are not to worry about me, my dear. I am not yet ready for the glue pot. You're not a horse, Granny Jane, I smiled up at her. You won't be turned into glue. A worm's breakfast then, said Granny. But let us assume that it is some time in the distant future. Today we are to comfort Miss Eversham and Rose, who have had such a grievous loss. Bell, pulling the trap, Bell, so Bell is the horse, trap is the wagon, began the turn into the Evermore Drive. Coming straight toward us was a police wagon drawn by huge black mares. Leonard got down and led Bell backward, making room for the shouting fellow on the other vehicle. What a palaver, said Granny Jane, tisking her disapproval of the police. Our trap creaked back into motion. Granny craned her neck, watching the police wagon clatter its way down the road. And an inspector gobbling his mustache, she said, is the last thing a bereaved family needs while they prepare for a visitation. I was in a bereaved family too, I thought. Nothing had been right since Papa died, and that was nearly a year ago. For how long did it take for grief to fade? Granny, I whispered after a moment, sometimes I think about Papa in the most unexpected moments, as if a garden snake has slithered through the, through the grass and arrived unbidden on my shoe. It sends a jolt right up my legs. The trap stopped. Stopped. 
Granny put her arm about my shoulders and gave me a hug. Well put, my dear. You will be a poet yet. Leonard helped us down and offered my grandmother the use of his arm for the journey to the front step. Thank you, young man. You may wait in the carriage yard until we are done. I wonder why the police were there and why they were going away so quickly like that, you know? Granny paused to look up. Such a lovely house, she said. Not to be gloomy, I said, but does it now belong to Rose? Don't know, my dear, she said. This is gossip of the most pertinent variety. With a stroke of unexpected wisdom, the captain willed the house to his sister and the money to his wife. This is why the two were forced into such uneasy proximity. Irma displayed enough good sense not to drag Rose from her childhood home, though I imagine she was waiting with bated breath for her daughter to be married so they could all go their separate ways. And now they needn't, I said. Go separate ways, I mean. Rose and her aunt can just go on living here together. They love each other dearly. Indeed, said Granny Jane. Let us hope that continues to be true. If one of them has poisoned Irma's tea, it might be quite an imposition on the other's loyalty, might it not? She patted her lip with a handkerchief and snapped shut her black tasseled handbag. Unless they planned it together, I suppose. Shall we go in? So Granny Jane's like, it's, Agatha's like Granny Jane, right? Granny Jane is sitting there trying to figure it out. And Charlotte's the one that's like, don't think about it, don't talk about it, right? The entrance of Evermore was dramatically draped with black crepe ribbon. Granny Jane's remark was most unsettling, coming as it did one minute before I was meant to be expressing sorrow to the bereaved. With one idle comment from my grandmother, I must reconsider the list of suspects. My instincts were hollering, no, not Miss Mary Ann, not Rose. But my common sense, so often in hiding, was calling out just as loudly. The two people apt to benefit most from the death of Irma Eversham waited beyond this door, receiving sympathy from friends and neighbors. Aunt and niece were the best of friends. Had my admiration assumed their innocence without sufficient examination? Were they, in fact, united in the gravest of deeds? This was not the moment to explore such a possibility, for now here we were in the formal, par formal parlor, the shades drawn and elaborate wreaths resting on every chair, <clears throat> obliging mourners to stand I struggled to bring out my memorized words. Please accept my deepest condolences for your terrible loss. Not a sound could I utter. Instead, I made a slight curtsy, which I thought Miss Mary Ann would appreciate knowing how devotedly I had practiced. When I raised my head, her eyes gazed most intently into mine, eyes rimmed with red and shadowed with exhaustion. Was this a woman meant to die by another's hand? Or could this be the face? of a poisoner. We won't know because that's the end of the chapter. The end of chapter nine.